Hello, welcome to Musical Talk this week. I'm outside Jonathan's house. Doorbell's not working as usual. Just pick him up to see Jersey Boys. He's in. Hello, dear. How are you? Uh, I'm not replying to that. Who's this to? This is Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. We have braved the crowds in Soho. And now we're in the crowds in Ketner's, which is a very well-known restaurant in, uh, well, very near the Prince Edward Theatre, where Jersey Boys is on. We got our tickets. We've got our tickets, so we're all very excited. And we've got a very good pianist on our left, as you can probably hear, playing some nice sort of bluesy riffs. We're just about to order. So, um, but you're a big fan of Frankie Valley, aren't you? Yeah, I, I, I used to love the Four Seasons uh, singles. I remember them as I was growing up. Well, I'm going to have the Four Seasons pizza, and we'll um, be back Hello. later on. Thank you very much. Oh, it's fantastic. It's absolutely wonderful. Here we are in the interval of Jersey Boys, and um, once I get my hearing... Uh, well, the sound is terrific. I mean, it is loud, but it's got to be, but it's not excruciatingly loud. And the guy um, playing... Ryan Malloy is his name. He's I'm, abs- I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his second name right. Malloy? Malloy? I, I, I'm not sure. But sounds Irish to me. He could be Irish, but my God, what a falsetto. I mean, it's just incredible. And um, they sound exactly like the Four Seasons, which is just great. And, and he's brilliant as Frankie Valley. The band is terrific. The production is stunning. It well, just well I, I, I was expecting them to sound like Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, but this is a very, very 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 good production it's excellent it is absolutely superb and it's it's uh, it, it gets it hits you right in the pit of the stomach i think because um especially that bass speaker especially the bass speaker uh, but it's it's just done with such pride when they sing it's just absolutely fantastic and you you, you forget you know how wonderful those songs are were and still are. I expect there's going to be a huge Four Seasons revival now. I bet there'll be loads of groups going around the country singing their stuff. I'm thrilled. Well, we had the revival, uh, not the revival, the, um, the sort of how popular they are nowadays in the opening when you had a, a Parisian rap version of uh, yes. Oh What a Night, which Tim would have loved. Yes, um, but I mean, I imagine we're going to get a wonderful version of that towards the end. Of course, we've got things like Let's Hang On to What We've Got, all those brilliant songs uh, coming up in the second half as well it's it's, just great it's interesting how the music in the first 10 or 20 minutes was very 1958 sort of chord one chord six chord four chord five well yes and of course um, then uh, Bob Gaudio um, manages to do something extraordinary with it just just ring the changes slightly and it suddenly it all sounds fresh and new it still does I mean we have sort of songs that you even though we're set in 65 60 well when was the British Revolution? Uh, about 1964. Yeah, so we're in the mid-60s now, but you still have songs that sound like they could be sort of like an R&B hit in 1987 or something. Well, I mean, I think people have done covers of them and, and, and added sort of hip-hop tracks to them and all that. But um, when he sings, um, oh, what's that beautiful song, uh, as you, Nick, said, has got some almost 70s harmonies in I can't think, My Eyes Adored You. But that's still sixes, you know, we're still there. We just got, in fact, in the first half to the British invasion. And we have a sort of uh, cliffhanger, if you want to call it that, when we're now, f- uh, one of the uh, guys is photographed with a mafia member, isn't it? We've got this yeah. mafia plot line coming in. Yeah, and he, and he wants his dosh back, because he's letting them dosh, and they're on some sort of deal, and presumably they haven't got the money, so we'll see what happens there. The star of the show, I think, technically, is the drum kit. Yes, and a brilliant drummer who's on stage through... Most of the numbers, I think. We have two drummers on stage. Um, what the show has is this drum kit, which sort of glides seamlessly all all over the stage, goes backwards, forwards. I think it's a and up and down. I think it's a house replacement in Mary Poppins. The sound is is phenomenally good. I have to say, all the way through. And I I don't know how they're doing that. I don't know if some of it's clip track or not. It doesn't seem to be, but I think it must be in places. I'm interested to know if they're playing their own instruments. It doesn't look like it to me from the guitarist point of view. I, I would doubt it. I would doubt that very much. But I'm looking up and occasionally we both are looking up to see the monitor screen. With We're not the, nerds at all. No, quite. With the, with the musical director there who's playing keyboards and conducting them at times. It's just great. You know a bit more than the Four Seasons than I do. Does, this, does it get quite um, CD, their story? Um, 
I don't think it does. I think they would have been uh, re-released on CD. No, no, d- does it get CD as in... Do we have any... Um, just drop my programme. Dropped his programme. <laughs> do we have any... Uh, Breakups in the band, any arguments, any made public? No, but they were called the Four Seasons, and much later on they became known as Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. So I'm wondering how that comes about because there's one of the guys in the group, I can't remember his name, it's the sort of self appointed leader of them. So I think that might cause a few jealousies and a few upsets. So I'm looking forward to that bit. A very strong cast, incredible staging, and much better staging than I thought it would be. And we have this sort of uh, act of Andy Warhol esque pop art. Um, projections that come down, which Tim would love. Uh, yes, and we even get um, uh, Ed Sullivan, who was the person on TV who introduced all the groups and all the British groups went over there and we see bits of him as well. And uh, there are lots of steel girders and things around the... You know, yeah, we have to say the Ed Sullivan footage is uh, blended in with live footage from the stage, which is very innovative, I think. Yes, and yes, you get the audience, actually, in the Ed Sullivan show, so you see all these 60s hairstyles and things, and, and girls well, screaming. Well, look at this audience, maybe some of this audience, actually. Well, I mean, everybody here is at a certain age, including myself, Nick's a bit young. I think this, the, the combined audience must be at least 20 billion, I think, of the age of the audience. But the great thing is, it's, it's nostalgia, but it's not necessarily nostalgia, because I think anybody younger you know, who doesn't know the Four Seasons is going to just get such a kick out of this show. Well, we do have to say this show isn't suitable for sort of very young children. There is some very strong language in the show and adult themes. No, but I think for, for, for people over sort of 14, it would be absolutely perfect. I mean me? Yes. Well, you, are you over 14, then? I don't know. Um, well, thank you very much for listening. And we'll be, <coughs> uh, we'll be back. Uh, I'm sounding like Frankie Valley now. <laughs> and we'll have some audience opinions then. Yeah. We're here with some, some audience members. Hello, your name is? Gene Kelly. Hello. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, this is Gene Kelly. Hello. Give us a tap dance. Gene Kelly. And uh, are you enjoying the show? Absolutely fabulous. Absolutely marvellous. I, I, I was there when the four seasons were around and everybody was there. And it's absolutely brilliant. Me and my friends have thoroughly enjoyed it. It's, it, it's fabulous. It's brought so many memories back. To songs, you know, when you were there doing it. And, you know, we were younger then. We're all, well, more mature ladies now. But, uh, no, it was fabulous. It, it's good. It, it's a fabulous show. Nobody seems to be getting with it. I think the crowd we're with aren't our age group, so they haven't lived through it. But we did. I think some of them, I think a lot of them are. Well, I am, for a start. I know, but there's an awful lot. Uh, My boss went to the opening night or the preview, and, and I mean, he's looking at, you know the other side of 65 and he came back absolutely marvellous he said it's great well we'd already booked our kid tickets we were going now it's good it's good I'm um, younger and I wasn't sort of I remember all the music so um, well the songs are so famous now yes, it's exactly. and a lot of those I, I actually didn't realise I'd sung them so most of them I know and it's all up yeah it's brilliant oh it's not it's wild it's, 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 it's actually it's fantastic an absolutely great evening to be out and, and I think it can only get bigger better and louder because that's what happens in these shows I, I'm hoping on the second half now we're going to go in because me and her are rocking, but nobody else is. We're thinking, right. I think there are a few people, and I think there are a lot of Frankie Valley fans out oh, there, Frankie aren't Valley, they? Yeah. yeah. The thing is, that who, whoever remembers the other names, um, it's not really a point, but the fact is, Gene Kelly and I are the only ones in ours that. Everybody else is static. We, went to, um, we compared this to. Um, we, we were rocky. We were rocky. Oh my God. We sat there for the first half, and the second half, it just ripped. I mean, it just went wild. Everybody got up, and everybody slapped. So, let's, let, like, it's the second half. Let's just do it now. We, you know, we're so reserved. Kathy, who is younger than I, us, yeah. by ten at least years. ten years. Ten years, yeah. ten years. I love it as well. And, um, I'm hoping at the end of it, they do it at the Queen, where everyone can get up and they play all the songs. Well, I, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but I've heard there isn't a mega mix at the end. It stays the whole story. No, not the last thing, won't. Well, <laughs> we're getting it, it won't. I'm well, going for and, this. And also, it, it, it hits you in the pit of your stomach, doesn't it? Oh, I mean, it's just it's, such an amazing sound. Well, as I say, we were there at the beginning, and... Uh, you know, it takes you back. Your life, you, you, you remember, a song always takes you back. Yeah. Where you were, what you did, who you were with. Absolutely. And, you know, music, if you love music, you can think, oh, I was with this guy, or I was there, or I was in this, this club, or I was in this bar. It, it just takes you back. 
and listening to this music, her and I absolutely, oh my God, do you remember this? It was like, oh, it's, it's fabulous. So far, it's fabulous. The journey inside is exciting. That's all I can say, really. It's fantastic. Because you're only 23 or something. Oh, well, he did not. Are you, are you getting so it? Young. Well, I was raised on oldies, so I know a lot right. of these songs. But like, like you, I, we I, were there. I didn't know that so many of them were Frankie Valli songs. I was a real oh, Beatles fan, minutes. and two and minutes. Of go. Very quickly, they talk about the British invasion, which of course we all remember. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Beatles, the Stones, yeah, exactly. Dusty. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yo, we all live like through it all. Brilliant, brilliant. I'm oh, well, so thank you. Thank you very much. So anyway, I'm going to have to The bus is going to be so sad. Wonderful, wonderful show there. Great. Wonderful show. It's over. It is over, and we're standing outside, as you heard, amongst the rickshaws and the jingle bells. And and Jonathan's playing with his mobile phone. And I'm just turning it on. But what a great show. Absolutely fantastic. And it really is uh, spectacular. And uh, the only thing is I would have liked to have heard more of the the songs because they don't tend to do them in whole but I think that's that's all right had a very long stretch in the second act without any music didn't we yes what was going on there exactly yeah that might have been a long girls as they call it possibly I did think mm, get on with it I think it was the scene when they were talking about um... yes quite well, there was an awful lot about contracts and things and problems there, weren't there? And the music business and things. This yes, very... which was moderately interesting, but uh, really it's the songs, isn't it? That's the thing with all these shows, you know, I mean, the good thing about the Buddy Holly story, for example, is there is a, a rock concert at the end of the 20 minutes of the show, and you don't really get that here tonight, as I said in the interval. No, we just got... Um, we got Oh What A Night, which was right at the end, wasn't it? The curtain, everybody was on their feet by that point. But not one of their biggest songs at the very end to end the show. Who Loves Who You? Who Loves You? Who Loves You, Pretty Baby? Yes, it was a big hit. That yeah. was a big hit. Um, but things like Let's Hang On, which is such a great, you know, to what we got, is, is one of the greatest of their songs. And we only got about half of that, and I, I think we could have done with a bit more. A lot of the critics are saying just when songs get good, they cut out, and we get back to the narration, which... Got on my nerves a bit, but it was fine because you knew when an, another song came around, it would be just as good. And also, there was a very good th- um, a, a piece at the end where each of the four of the four seasons um, talked about what they were doing now and then left the stage and then came on for a grand reunion when they're inducted the, into the hall. The denouement, if you will. The denouement. Um, uh, yeah, no, no. It's, but it, it's great. I mean, it's just it's just a great evening out. And you said you're going to say it again. Yeah, I thought I might take my sister to see it because she was a huge fan. So, you know, I probably will see it again. Yeah, because the music is so great and the performances are staggering. Great choreography. Terrific. Audience stop on their feet dancing for the fun. Yeah, fun. by the end they were. Even oh, you, Jonathan. Uh, I wasn't dancing. I'm standing up. You're waving around. At least I was able to stand up. Um, yeah, I, I don't think tonight was probably the greatest audience that they've ever had, I have a feeling. I mean, they were very appreciative, but I would think that it'll get better. Let's go again on the Saturday in about two months' time. If it's still playing, though, now, do you think this will run and run and run and run? I think it might pick up. I'm not quite sure why, but I think it will. I just have that funny feeling with something. that I think there's so many Four Seasons fans and Frankie Valley fans, and I think once word gets more out than it is at the moment, it'll be word of mouth, I think. I think it's going to be huge. Well, our word of mouth is this is a wonderful, wonderful show and very well staged, better staged than I thought it would have been. Yeah. And... Uh, what a, oh, what a night, yes, as, as we said. Absolutely, and, and, and oh, what a joy. Oh, uh, what a night. We're welcoming Stephen Bell, mm-hmm. who you've heard in previous episodes. Sorry, we're in Burger King at the moment. This is why you, you may hear us guzzling and slurping in the background. We've just seen Andy and We Were Rocky, but we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, last night you saw Spamalot. Spamalot. It's been a while since we talked about Spamalot in the podcast. And you've seen the one on Broadway, Steve. What yes, did you think a few of, times. What do you think of the one you saw last night here in London? Well, what surprised me last night is how, how tiny the stage is. The Broadway stage is much wider and deeper, so I was wa- wondering if everything was going to fit on the stage, and of course it does. Just smaller. So, yeah, well, a little closer. Everybody's a little closer together. Also, I was sitting third row center on the center aisle, um, so I was able to get a, a pretty good view in New York. I've only seen it from uh, the, the what we call the mezzanine, which is actually the balcony. 
Not the dress circle, that's... No, there is no... Nobody calls it a dress circle, unless you're in the opera house. <laughs> Perhaps bite into my double whopper with cheese, so forgive me if I start making a mess of it. And who did you see in it? Alan Dale was playing King Arthur. I honestly don't remember the names of anybody else because I didn't recognize the names. The, the woman who played Lady of the Lake is from Sweden, Norway. She won a reality TV show... To, to get to get that part? To get this part. Oh. How was her English? Her English was was fine. You can understand it completely. She sang very well. She there were parts of it that were different from Broadway. I had seen Sara R- uh, Ramirez was yeah. the original and she was phenomenal and won the Tony Award for it. And then I saw Marin Maisie do it and she was also quite funny. Uh, and different, because she's a different personality, and this woman last night did it her own way also. She did an awful lot of mugging and making faces and things of that sort, which in this particular piece doesn't detract at all. As a matter of fact, the audience loved it. So I I think she did a really wonderful job. And when she came out and and sang Whatever Happened to My Part, she just brought down the house. It was really wonderful. What did she sing when she does her riff in that um, in this Las Vegas oh, number? Yeah. When I saw it, they sung... This was at the time when the How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria mm-hmm. show start, was popular on television. So she was going, How do you solve a problem um, like Maria? I don't remember what she did. It was very funny. The one who played um, Sir Robin went into um, another hundred people at one point. Start from company. Yes, that's a new thing they've added in. How was Alan Dale? The people I was with were very excited to see him because they all know Ugly Betty. Right. and West Wing and uh, various other American programs that he's been on, you know, programs seen in America. So they were all excited to see him. I didn't know him from Adam, or I didn't know him from Alan, and I felt that his TV technique just didn't work on the stage. He was, he was barely walking through the part, didn't open his mouth, didn't even crack a smile until the curtain calls. It, he was depending on the microphone for everything, rather low energy. Um, I noticed that in the production, and, and this is true of many long-running productions, unless the, unless the stage manager and the director are really on top of it, that it de- does tend to get a little unfocused and a little low energy. And I've, I felt that in, in many parts, this show, last night, Spam a Lot, could use a little, little perking up. What uh, happened were, to the parts? Yeah. Everybody had their moment to shine and they made the most of it. But when they weren't in the spotlight, they were walking through it. It was very low energy. The, the chorus smiled a lot. They smiled real big. But you can tell that they weren't really putting a lot of effort into the steps. But unless you know what you're supposed to be seeing, often you don't notice that at all. And so you're here on a trip? Yes. For a week with your students? With students to see theater. Say hello to all your students. Well, hello, everybody. We saw Major Barbara at the National. How was she? Two nights ago. Oh, she was very good. Oh, it was a wonderful production. It was really wonderful. Um, and then we saw uh, Spamalot last night, and I came to see We Will Rock You tonight while they all went to see Chicago, which I've already seen four times. I really didn't want to see it again. I've and, been there, got the T-shirt. Yeah. And tomorrow night we're going to be... Um, seeing Taming of the Shrew at RSC. But We Will Rock You, let's not degrade onto plays. We Will Rock You. Now we talked about this at length on the podcast, but um, it's been a while since I've seen it, and it's nice to see there are some changes in the script. We had a character that was called Britney Spears, and she's now he, she is now called uh, Brittany. Victoria Beckham. Oh, Victoria Beckham. Which, you know, is... Um, a reference, sure signs to how famous she is now. Mm-hmm. She's even famous in the States. Yes. Would we or you work on Broadway? I can tell you now that the critics will absolutely hate it. I hated it here as well, but that means nothing. In thinking about it, in thinking like what I would say if you asked me that question, um, I have to say that it's not great theatre, but it's great entertainment. This is not advancing the Broadway cause. It is not... Uh, you know, a well-integrated, um, coherent Broadway musical, but it is so entertaining. The music is very, very well done. Very well done. That band was phenomenal, and when was the last time you saw a band get the final bow? <laughs> to actually come down onto the stage and, and take, a, take, a company, take a bow with the company. Well, the band is always made up of old rock musicians from mm-hmm. the 60s. And, you know, Who've um, been playing this stuff forever and, yeah. and grew up with it. Knew Some it when it was new. Sometimes they even have Brian May. If 
he's around in London, he will. He, he loves this show so much. He will come and play in the pit. Just sit in, <laughs> and he comes on the stage at the end and, and plays a solo. And you can imagine, you know, the two thousand six hundred people mm-hmm. shocked to see. Yeah, it's almost as if Freddie just came on stage, <laughs> but. Um, I think they'd be a little more shocked if Freddie came on the stage. The technology is not that high yet. So we, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's all it is. It's a very, very enjoyable production. I think it is the most enjoyable show in London for just everyone. Because yeah. it, as I was saying to you earlier, it's not a show for Broadway fans. It's a show for people who want to be entertained. Right. It should be called, but it, we, it but should it, be called We Will Entertain You. Absolutely. But just keep in mind that it's not for people who don't like loud music. Yes, it's quite is, loud. I think this is the loudest show I have ever seen. Or heard. Or heard. It's the, <laughs> Attend- quite, it's the quietest show I've ever heard. Yeah, it's just amazing. The, the characters annoy you at all, because I find them a bit grating now after many times I've seen the show. They didn't annoy me other than some of the book scenes, especially at the beginning of the second act, before things got rolling again, were just a little too long. You know, at that point, nobody cared about the exposition. Um, we knew that the two of them were going to get together. Just do it already and let's move on. Um, in the first act, I was really trying to follow the story and make sense of it and, and justify it. And, and you gave up. Just absolutely gave up. There's no point. There were just so many inconsistencies and, and implausibilities that it just, oh, forget it. Just go with it. <laughs> now, last night you saw a spam a lot. Mm-hmm. Last night I saw... I was at the opening night for Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. And you must have a couple of questions about this for me. Well, one of the things is I understand that it's not, it's specifically not based on the movie, that it's based, based more on the novel. One of the major characters in the novel is a character named Archie. Was Archie in this production? Ashley was in this production. No, no, Ashley is always there. Archie worked for, for, um, uh, for Scarlet. Works for what and what way? In, in, as a servant, uh, not he's not black. He's um, but he he was. All the servants are black. Oh, okay. Yes. And no, did, I, and I, did she still only have the three husbands? Because she had about five husbands in the original. To novel. be completely honest, I have no idea. It was the most confusing oh. show I've ever seen. But not because it's bad direction. We can't say it's bad direction because it's directed by the best director here to direct probably in the world at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, why do restaurants have to play music? What's the point? What what use does music have to man or beast in the restaurant? Sorry, I'm just going on a tangent here. <laughs> what purpose does it serve? It, anyway, it fills the silences. <laughs> conversation can fill the silence much mm-hmm. happier. She had a lot of husbands. Mm-hmm. I think there were four. I couldn't tell you their names. I couldn't tell you why she got rid. Of, I mean, she was she's a really nasty character. Mm-hmm. And come the famous line. When yeah. um, Rhett Butler says to her, "Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn." Yeah, and that didn't become a song. Man. No, no, oh, no, thank no. Goodness. The, the okay. guy, the guy playing it, Darius Dinesh, has this most resonant, amazing, basso profundo mm-hmm. speaking voice. He puts on for this role. Yeah, and that line got a round of applause from the audience. We've hated this character for so long. Really? That when she's finally. Cast you off. hated that character? Well, I think we grow to hate her. She becomes a real bitch. Oh, Scarlet, you're yeah. talking about. Not, okay, not, not, I thought you were talking about Red. No, no, Red. no. Sorry, Scarlet. Yes, mm-hmm. we come to hate Scarlet so much that she was... Come her casting out of this man's life, it gets a round of applause. The thing which bothers me about this show and many other shows, like the producers and maybe even Oliver, is that the person who's credited for writing the music... To me, writing a melody is not writing the music. Mm-hmm. To me, writing the music is writing a full piano score with every single melody in there and chords and bass lines. And you, you know, you're a musician. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. all about that. And I don't think it's right when someone else takes it all and makes it into a much and weaves it into yeah, a score, a much better mm-hmm. thing. And this show is three and a half hours of continuous music wow. with lots and lots and lots of dialogue. Mm-hmm. It's very, very underscored. Um, the two best songs in the show were from the Slaves. Mm-hmm. Mammy sings one song. All the Slaves sing one song. So the three best songs. And the third best song is sung by one of the younger slaves who, her I Want song, where she wants to learn to read and become, you know, a, a teacher in, a teacher in the Well, future. that's certainly the acknowledgement of the 21st century because 
That wouldn't have happened back then. So that's then trying to be politically correct, do you think? Mm-hmm. Interesting. The rest of the music, though it was very well sung, was forgettable, but I think it was forgettable because there was so much music. It, to have a memorable song, it needs to appear between two bits of dialogue with no music. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And as it's continu- and there's and there was no motif for the characters or something something that kept coming back that was recognizable that you can latch onto. I mean, it's not integrated, you know, to sort of Bernstein or um, Sondheim standards, but it's more. There was a harp pattern that would play, and they'd rep- lots of reprises. Mm-hmm. But I enjoyed the evening. I think because I was there and everyone else was enjoying it, every- everyone wanted to be there. I'm not sure how it will run here. There's no way we can tell yet. The reviews were released today. Two stars, one star. Yeah, it was very um, mixed to negative. Yeah, you know, headlines, frankly, my dear, we don't give a damn, you know, all that. Well, we got to expect that. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they want to bring it to Broadway. Mm-hmm. It would have to be done in a proscenium arch stage. And I'll talk about the design in a second. I think it may do better on Broadway than it does here because it's such an American standard novel. It's also a bigger risk on Broadway because it is it is such a classic novel, so you're playing with fire there in a way. Well, speaking of playing with fire, do they actually burn Atlanta? Is that part of the... Uh, part it occurs of the in the middle set? of the second act, first act even. Mm-hmm. I thought it was very effectively done. It's very theatrical, it's very Trevor. A flag comes down the... Um, the, 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 const- the flag of the Constitution. Oh, the that Confederacy. The con- confederacy, yeah. sorry. Comes down. It's set alight by two people carrying torches. Mm-hmm. And then the whole set, which is very globe like in its um, design, you know, there's a sort of. It engulfs the whole audience in a, in a, round, in a round circle, mm-hmm. if there are any other kinds of circles, with a main house in the middle that would rotate at different angles. So you had. Each four sides of the house was a different set okay. style, but it was like the globe where you had that um, mm-hmm. s- s- structure in the middle, and there was rooftops and trees all around, and uh, posters, some Negro for sale posters, original posters yeah. from the 19th century, yeah. which is very fascinating. The whole set collapsed. When on, the, the, on purpose. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Opening night, nerves. <laughs> Yes, the whole set collapsed in time with the flag, but mm-hmm. that, that was done very well. I do have to give a warning, though, if you're like our presenter, Jonathan Cohen, don't go to this show if you don't like sudden loud noises or bangs or gunshots mm-hmm. or booms or thunder or anything like that because it does get very, very, very loud. Unlike the show tonight, which is continuous loud, yeah. this is suddenly loud. But a, a very enjoyable show. And it's, I mean, you can't deny the ambition behind this musical and the talent behind it. I mean, Trevor Nunn, John Napier has done the set design who did um, you know, Caps and Labus yeah. and Miss Saigon and Sunset Starlight Express. Bar and Starlight Express, all these brilliant shows. Mm-hmm. And of course our friend Bill Brown has done the orchestrations, Gareth Valentine has done the music supervising. But to me the biggest flaw is having someone who hasn't written a show before write this show. The score you're talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The book, music, and lyrics. There is a musical of Gone with the Wind written by Harold Rome. Have you seen this? No. I haven't seen it, and I haven't heard it. But I know that it exists. And I believe that it was produced in Japan. Somewhere or other there's a recording of it. And I'm sure... But the ending of the first act and the second act is a song called Gone with the Wind. It ends with her saying, I'll never be... My life is gone with the wind. It, it, it needs Scarlett O'Hara sings this song about her, something about her life. Needing this is to after she's back to Tara. It's been destroyed. Yeah, because in the movie, it, it's a perfect. It, the movie is in has an intermission, and the first half of the movie ends with her, as God is my witness, I'll never go hungry again, which is her resolving to do whatever she needs to to keep Tara. Now, you're saying that you hate this character, but in the novel and in the movie, you understand that she's doing this just to hold on to her family homestead. That everything that she's been doing, she's been marrying for money, she's been... been uh, you you know, can't play with people's emotions like that for the sake of the home. I mean, but I, I have no idea how important the home is to her. That's never really... Um, the opening is very confusing in this show. Mm-hmm. It's such a vast space. I mean, it's not vast, it's barren, and there are actors everywhere, and they're scattered in, up in the dress circle, and they're down there, and they're all 
talking to each other and you don't know where to look or where to hear because all the sounds going from one direction so yeah. there's no acoustic voices uh, another thing which seemed a bit odd to me was characters breaking it out of dialogue and going into narration we don't need that uh, you know she said one character will say Scarlet walked over to the door and opened it and oh that kind of stuff really. now in the movie there was narration done as as um, what used to be like title cards that that would that would come up that would bridge the, the sections of the story just so you know what happened but getting specific like she walked across to the door that just seemed to rather bit that's not very it's not Trevor Nunn to me that's yeah. a, an amateur besides writing. in theatre you don't tell about it you do it yeah that's what a lot of the reviews are saying but, you know I mean I'm really happy we have a new musical in London that is British based very curious to see how it survives and uh, whether it will be gone with the wind <laughs> do you know if it's going to be recorded ten weeks ago they do they said let's do a cast recording mm-hmm. but who knows you know they're very expensive to do nowadays and no one's buying them anyway but if you want any musical to have a life you have to have a recording mm-hmm. the only way some of these musicals gets out there is by people picking up the, the CD yeah. and they listen to it and they say why didn't why wasn't this a big hit this is so wonderful and then, of course, you read the book, the script, and you want, then you, then you know why it didn't. Trevor Nunn has got the credit of adapting, of, of adapting the mm-hmm. script, and I think without him, it wouldn't have happened. Is he credited as the book writer or just no, as adapter? Just, just adapter, Ad- adaptation, adaptation. Mm-hmm. whatever that means. You know, I mean, all credit to this lady Margaret uh, Mitchell, Mar- 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 Margaret Martin, who has written oh. the, the book, <laughs> music and lyrics. Mm-hmm. Says her biography begins. She has a degree in child behaviour from UCLA. This is her first play. Well, what's she doing writing her first? You know, I mean, maybe I'm envious. You know, yeah. if someone has <laughs> po- mailed a script to Trevor Nunn and it's now playing in the West End five years later. That's not how it works. I think like Lord, of, known somebody. like Lord of the Rings, this has to be a show you have to see for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to form your own opinion. Lord of the Rings is a very long play that has music. This is actually written as a musical. That the music advances the plot and, ca- and there's exposition through the music and things of that sort. Yeah. Some songs weren't needed and there are moments where songs were needed. Someone is singing on their deathbed. It may work in opera but it's a bit cheesy in mm-hmm. a sort of musical theatre situation. The gospel spiritual songs are brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. We have a, a singer, a gospel singer in the show called Natasha Yvette Williams, who's famous on Broadway for doing Colour Purple and um, Flaherty and Aaron show. Dessa Rose. Dessa Rose. Yes. Um, she was in that as well. Mm-hmm. And she was one, she played Mammy. But I, I'm not really one to comment because I haven't seen the film mm-hmm. or read the book. So this is my only. Well, then you. You're just taking it as a theatre piece. Yes, I'm happy I haven't seen the book. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the problem with people coming in with too many preconceived notions. Yeah. And I enjoyed it for what it is. I have no reason to bash it because it's not something Mm. I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. Let's see where it is in three months' time. Yeah. Steve, I hope you have a fantastic remainder of your trip. Thank you. And uh, we'll have you back on the show. You're going to become a New York correspondent. I guess so. And with that, I am back in the Prince Edward uh, Theatre and back in the dressing room where I once interviewed Gavin Creel, now chatting to Ryan Malloy, is, who is playing Frankie Valley. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Excellent. Good. Thank you. To say, I, I saw the show last week and it's phenomenally good. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's uh, it's such a great pleasure to um, you know, be able to you know, be in a show with such a fantastic script and, and great songs and it's a real challenge every night, you know, just to you, you live that guy's life. And it was a, it's a really special thing to do. And um, we're just all having great fun down here at the Prince Edward. So it's going really well. What is your favorite moment within the show? I don't know. It's pretty tough because the, I, th- I think at the end of the show, it's it's like when, when we're all facing the back and, you know, we're all preparing to do our monologues and sum up the show. It's it's amazing. You, you, you just look out into the, um, you know, the, uh, the backdrop of, of New Jersey and you just think about just going through your mind about everything that you've been going through in the show and the entire journey that that you've been going through from being a 16 year old you know kid all the way up to like um you know middle-aged you know late you know early 50s all of the things that have happened to you with you know i mean i won't um i won't i won't won't spoil it by you know giving uh secrets away but you know it is such a roller coaster ride and I, i just think at that moment when i'm when i'm at the back and i'm just thinking about everything that's that's gone before and the friendships 
which which have you know evolved and and then broken up and you know all the heartache and with with the uh you know everything coming full circle i think that point when everything comes full circle and the show is my favorite part the denouement in the end it is it is a denouement a denouement fantastic and, and what's most challenging the most challenging part in the show is i don't i don't know i mean i think the show as a whole again, again you know because you it's not just it's not just one separate thing it it never stops moving you know what i mean it's constantly it's a very very quick show the the pace is frenetic everything is moving around you you're moving with the show there's always something going on the entire cast are involved in bringing something on or taking it off and it's it's like a roller coaster ride and i, I just think you know the the most the the most rewarding thing in the show is to keep your focus up for the you know the two hours that that you're on and and afterwards you know you really get the benefits of that when you come off stage this show when i saw it it almost has a sort of a military like timing mm. to the whole procedures and it is and i think you know the the credit of that goes to Sergio Trujil who's who's our choreographer and he's just a fantastically talented man and it's brilliant to work with and i mean he um all the transitions you know uh, from from scene to scene that he puts together that that he's got going on are so smooth and and you know so like you say so military and, and uh, seamless but you know it takes a lot of rehearsal i mean we were in rehearsal for like about four months to you know to get all that right and the dancing into the singing into the because everything is choreographed in the show but he does it in such a great subtle way that you actually can't tell you know what's choreographed and what's natural and, and it's just you know the credits off to you know Sergio for you know putting together a, f a fantastic piece like that and the motif of signs within the show and of course the, the great line it, it's a sign yeah yeah, that that's my only joke in the show, uh, which is nice. Everybody else gets like uh, you know tons of jokes, and I get I get that one I get that one joke. But I'm grateful. I'm grateful. It's a good joke. And I thank you to Rick and Marshall for that one. Well, when I saw it, it was you know I started a round of applause that evening. Oh, thank you, thank you very much for, for, the, for the joke. And there's another great scene with involving a gun, which I won't give anything away. But yeah. that that always goes down very well. Just gives you an insight into how life was in in Belleville, New Jersey back then. You know about how if you wanted to pick up a little something special for your girlfriend or or your wife, you'd you maybe you know bend the rules a little bit and go and buy some you know your stolen jewelry or something like that. But that's what these guys were into. You know what I mean? Things that fell off the back of a truck. I see a guitar behind you. You're obviously a songwriter as well, and also from uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood mm. fame. How different are the vocal arrangements between the original Four Seasons songs and the vocal arrangements within this show? Um, they're a lot more complex, I think, and the uh, the tempos of the songs are, are a lot faster. I mean, you hear a lot of the old stuff, and it's really... Um, uh, we hear our show, and then you hear the old stuff. The old stuff sounds like a bit of a dirge. I mean, you would never think to listen to Sherry and... You know, think that it was a slow song. You'd always think there was an up tempo, but it was you know really kind of like you know down there in the um, the RPMs. But um, can't take my eyes off you. Is is like really is is quite quick. But you get used to the pace. I mean, every everything's quick in the show, and the, and the vocal arrangements that Ron Melrose has put together are are fantastic. You know, he's he's found you know different different kind of places to go, and really utilizing all the great voices that we have in the show, and uh, it really makes a, a spectacular you know um, uh, sonic picture. It's beautiful within London and. Less so, I think, on Broadway, there are lots of jukebox musicals. Yeah. What is it that makes Jersey Boys different to you? Well, it's got to be the story. I mean, I, I, you know, a lot of a lot of the shows, which are the jukebox musicals, you know, I've got their set amount of songs, and then they just nail a script around those songs. And I think that's what one thing that Jersey Boys doesn't do. It started off with a really strong book, and uh, people got interested in that. And you know, Des really. Um, as a as a very big dramatic actor and you know, he's working in Canada at the minute you know with the um you know doing a lot of Shakespearean stuff up there and and it is you know the tragedy that that holds this piece together and the songs really bring the light into the the darkness of what these guys' lives were uh, but the two marry up together perfectly Bob crew and Bob Gaudio and Frankie Valli were all a big part of this show. Yeah. Uh, the, one of them died. Didn't Bob Crew die? No, no, Bob's, Bob no. Crew's still going. I mean, he really is the uh, the Andy Warhol of our times. I don't know if you've ever you know, seen anything on him. And he is this you know, gorgeous, handsome man uh, who is this you know, male model. And you know, he got into music you know, as, as, as a bit of a sideline. But then it turns out to be an absolutely fantastic uh, you know, lyricist. Wrote, wrote Can't Take My Eyes Off You. Um, and also into the other ones, I think um, Big Girls and Walk Like a Man, he was involved in all those. And other songs that he was involved in, I mean, I mean, he's just paramount songwriter and a great visionary as well, to, you know, to pick these bands up and make them into what they were. The thing which I really loved coming out of the show was learning how many songs Bob Gaudio and Bob Crew did write mm. together. It's really, I mean, no one, I was so surprised when they, it was 
Have you ever seen um, Jekyll and Hyde? No, no, no. But I've heard great things about it. I've heard for, for, double bow. For, for some people, that show, it's like, you know, if you're an actor, you go to that show not knowing any of the songs and you think, I've heard that one before, I've heard that one before yeah. because they just become standards outside of um, their story. But did you work with... And any of the two Bobs or Frankie Valley for this role? Yeah, I did. I worked. I worked a lot with uh, with Bob uh, Gordio in Nashville, Tennessee. I went down there for a week in uh, December of last year, and we, and we just you know focused on sing, you know singing the songs through, you know messing around with tones and you know different different emotions that went into the the songs. And he gave me a great back history and also told me some fantastic anecdotes about you know the the time on the road. And it was brilliant when I was down there. You really got the feel that you were in that band and. You know, there were times when I actually thought I was Frankie Valley, so it was it was it was great just the way Bob was, you know, speaking to me and asking me to do things and the harmonies that he was firing at me. He couldn't have got closer to the truth, so it was, it was pretty wild. It was a great time. And you're a songwriter yourself. Yeah, I'm a songwriter. I've been a songwriter. Um, well, it's basically where I started out. I went to Los Angeles um, when I used to live in Newcastle, and I, I went over there to become an actor and, and got involved in music and, and started singing around the clubs of South Central LA and, and got a record deal over there and was brought back to London and. I had my my deal, which I was a, a singer songwriter, and I've al- I've always been involved in that, and I've got my you know I've just finished finishing touches of going down to my album, which is going to be available on my website. So, you know, and we're going to do a little deal with iTunes, and you know, it's it's going to be great. You know, maybe I'll get a little some of that success of the Four Seasons will rub off on me. You've actually you know hit the nail on the head, man. My question was: now you've obviously studied this music and the um, the vocal style of. Gaudio and crew and Valley. Have you are you influenced by their style now for any more future writing projects? I definitely think it'll you know something which is absorbed in in into me and, and hopefully it'll come out in a very creative way. I even hit single way. I mean, that'd be quite nice, uh, quite nice to write it like you you know a can't take my eyes off you or a sherry or something like that. I mean, you can dream about those things and, and pray that they happen. And uh, you know it's something I've been trying to do all my life and. Um, you never know when the time is right, but you know, in, in the piece it says, "This is your time." You know, Bob Bob says that to Frankie, and you know, it, it, it's a good time for me right now, and you know, everything's really going well with with the acting and the and the singing. So it would be nice to go full circle with that and get a single out there, get a record out there, you know, and really make it work and watch the people, you know, embrace that. It'd be a, it'd be a great thrill. I have heard rumors somewhere on the line that they're talking about a movie yeah. of, of Jersey Boys. Yeah, I think they'll be doing the movie in the next two to three years. And uh, Steven Spielberg is is involved. Um, I think he's bought the rights to the movie. But um, you know, it, it's all open. Who's going to play the roles and and who's going to who's going to direct it and you know who's going to sing it and uh, but I don't know. It'd be a fantastic movie. I'm I'm sure whatever happens, you could be in it. I think. I mean, because you, you sound very Italian American. Maybe mm-hmm. that's because you've been doing the accent every night. Or yeah. I mean, uh, you were born in England in yeah. in Newcastle. You said. Yeah. So born Geordie, and then you went to UCLA. Yeah. An honours in drama. Yeah. Congratulations! Okay. So, so, so you sort of adopted the American accent, and uh, um, now you're, you're you're back home. It was something I had I had to do when I was in um, when I was in Los Angeles. I went for a lot of castings when I was there, and I, my accent was so thick and northern that I couldn't get I couldn't get any work. You know what I mean? There was no appeal for it, so I had to had to start studying these Samuel French tapes to get a um, you know just to get a normal, natural, you know, non dialect, non uh, regional um, American dialect, and. The minute I did that, I got a record deal in London, and so I had to come back. So that really messed my accent up to you know, no avail. Can you go back into Newcastle accent or Irish? Yeah, usually when I get when I, when I get drunk or very annoyed, I go I go straight back into um my uh my Newcastle uh, an Irish accent. But um, yeah, I mean it's definitely there. I mean you know, you you never forget where you're from. <laughs> um, it's funny when I was uh, on your website, I looked at you and I thought, oh my god. It's Bill. You are, I mean, you, for, for Bill and Ted, if that yeah. were to be a musical, I was saying to myself, you would be Bill. And now you, I've read that you were Bill yeah. in Bill and Ted. W- w- was this a musical version? Yeah, that was, that, that was a great thing that we did in Edinburgh, um, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I think it was about, you know, I think it was six years ago or something. And we did Bill and Ted's excellent musical adventure. And it, it was a lot of fun. I, w- I worked with a lot of great actors on that. And, and we had a lot of fun. And and uh, it was a real eye opener, you know, d- doing the festival because you were so surrounded by so many talented people, and the energy up there is always so great. And you know, every day you're doing a show. And I was just up there um, last year with Eurobeat, which was, you know, that that went crazy as well. And it's it's just great to be in a, an environment surrounded by so many talented people and, and doing your part as well, and, and drinking every night and, and dancing around and celebrating. Going, well, hey, is that the Eurovision Song Contest musical that it they is, were? Yes, yes, yeah. That, that, I mean, that's going on tour this year. So uh, I mean, that's going to be uh, that's going to be a phenomenal hit I'm, I'm sure it's a fantastic show 
And you're in Tonight's the Night, which is another jukebox musical. Yeah, I mean, I mean that show was uh, that was great. It was directed by C.J. Ranger and, and taken care of by um, Phil McIntyre, who does uh, uh, We Will Rock You. And we went out on the road, and and you know we had a, we had a fantastic time. I met some great friends on that show, and it was it was a real challenge. That was the first time that I you know stepped up to leading a show, and you know that kind of focus and and what that took and the responsibility that it was, and all the songs were you know it was Rod Stewart, so it was, it was very difficult. And it was hard, it was hard on the voice. So in that you know you teach yourself how to how you train yourself to pace yourself and how to you know get through from one show to the next, and you know to keep that. Uh, keep the stability of your performance up and, and how to play a lead but that's really what that, that show gave me it was fantastic so it was a stepping stone to uh, Jersey Boys well yeah I think every, everything is you know that you do in your life is every decision that you make gets you to the point where you are right now and you have to accept that and, and enjoy it as well and, and I think that was you know that was important about when I played um, Aussie and On the Town I was with three other sailors and uh, it was it was a fantastic. It was great to be involved in a Bernstein musical at the ENO. But the the fantastic thing that that you know g- gave me was the camaraderie between you know us three sailors and how we took on the world and we take on New York for this one night for twenty four hours. And it really transcends back into Jersey Boys. How you know we're a, you know we're just four guys against the world trying to better our situation out of out of the um, out of the sums of Belleville to the heights of you know to the you know the pop stardom. Most musicals, if you look at them, they are based on the American dream. Mm. Um, whether it be you know Rodgers and Hammerstein or all these, and and but in a way this is different because it's true and it, it really hits home for you know me as a songwriter and probably you as a songwriter even though you've experienced the, what it's like to have critical fame you are probably influencing a lot of audience members by by reintroducing the music of Frankie Valli in the Four Seasons do you think there'll be a sort of big resurgence of their music now? I think there is a big knock on, especially when you know a lot of, a lot of you know like mothers bring their children to see this, and the, the you know the children are like sixteen, eighteen years old, and they kind of get dragged down, and they come and see it, and then all of a sudden they find out you know a whole new you know chapter on music that they, n- they never knew before, and it's uh, we be- by the second act we've become their new favorite band. It's like you know it's we become a real band, and it's just like it's like it's theirs, and they, they go through within the sh- short space of the show, which is like a two hour space, they go through a, you know an entire life, so they have everything within that small space and it's it's a great it's a great feeling and when I saw the show in New York that was one of the things I realized that you know the audience was was you know 26 you know 24 all the way up to like you know 65 70 and it's the the range of how many people that this uh the story touches and and that the music gets to is it is phenomenal the powerful effect of their music is represented in the opening number where we go we skip the 60s and 50s music and go straight into hip hop with um yeah. a sort of a, a European Eurobeat version of uh, Oh What a Night, and that really represents how influential this group were. It is. It's it's, it's the uh, it's the juice galore, baby, juice galore. It's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. The um, uh, TJ really you know goes for that in the old French accent there and, and rocks the house, and it takes a lot of people by surprise. They they actually you know think they've come to see the wrong show or something. And there, apparently there was a lot of people in New York who just you know, got up and walked out and didn't really realize what what was going on. But then it's great how it transcends into um, into silhouettes with the you know the the vision of the three guys coming forward, and uh, you know Tommy DeVito, uh, Nick Massey, and Nick DeVito how they how they come out of you know the shadows and it's it's just a great moment in, in theater. It's one of my favorite moments. Is the Joe Pesci story true? It is. It is true. And they were in, the fact that. The fact of the matter, it's either it's even truer than it is. They were in a jazz band together, um, Bob and um, Joe, and Joe was playing the bass, and uh, he was a really good friend of uh, Frankie Valley's, and they all lived in a really close, you know, estate on the neighborhood, and um, and yeah, and yeah, it was it was right there. I mean, all these guys have been friends forever, you know, and Frank Sinatra lived down the road in Hoboken, and he, you know, he got out of there, and they he really inspired those guys. I mean, the, you know, the Italian immigrants and. They were all, you know, clumped together in this in this little place in New Jersey, and relationships just formed, and it was it was fantastic. I mean, I really want to hear Joe Pesci's bass playing. I heard he's I heard he's a whiz. What hits home also is the um, for British audiences is the mention of the British Revolution and how yeah. uh, they even over mm-hmm. they even overcame that. I think that was one of the big things when all the British acts went over there, when you were like the Beatles and and the Stones and everything else. A lot, a lot of that music in America really faded away. They really didn't have the legs to, you know, to to stand all this fantastic songwriting that was coming over and you know Lennon McCartney and stuff like that and Richards and Jagger. But I mean, they were the only band really that that um, that got through it all, and and they did have a go, uh, have a good go at them. You know, wrote songs like Dawn through that time, and it was like, I mean. 
for them to to stand the test of that of that moment in time was was is absolutely a fantastic testament to their um, songwriting and uh, performance abilities. One visual element of the show I love is the um, the screens that come down, especially when you have the Ed Sullivan footage. I think that works incredibly well. And you have the sort of live cameras on the uh, filming you, and uh, and then you have it's blended in with footage, I, I guess, of the original Ed Sullivan show. Mm. Uh, how is it for you, sort of? Is there a screen in the wings that you look at and you see yourself, or no? You never, never see yourself. I mean, um, that's that's what's great. So when you walk on stage, you, you are basically in that TV studio, and and you're you're back in that time. And it, it's you know, every time we go on and do that, it's very exciting because it is live. You know what I mean? It, it, all everything that you see is live. All the cameras, all the shots, and so everybody's you know, everybody that's involved is involved in like a live musical moment you know it's great that they didn't record any of that and, and it is that kind of has that vibrance to it and uh, um it's it's a great moment in the rare opportunities that the audience get to applaud mm. they went on for absolutely ages and i remember you you and the guys just standing there and winking at the audience and sort of re- really really enjoying that moment it must be wonderful it is it's, it's it's a great um it's a great section of the show because the audience have waited so long to hear you know uh, a four season song and the first one they do here after 40 40 minutes is sherry and well it's like a bus really you know you wait for ages for one to come along and then three come along at the same time we do go to sherry uh you know walk like a man and big girls don't cry i mean they're all there you know one after the other and it's uh yeah it just really really messes with the audience a bit they just kind of go crazy has uh your um doppelganger come to see the show he has. He came on press night, and uh, every time I meet him, it's 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 such a fantastic honor. He's such a great man. He he's got one of the most magical voices of all time, you know. And he is the the godfather of falsetto. Always comes with fantastic advice. Really warm heart. Always, you know, in his life, he's wanted to do the the right thing. Take care of his friends. Take care of his family. And uh, down to earth man. I can't can't say anything. You know, can't say enough good things about him because he's. He's a he's a lovely guy. I love the V man. He's he's top look. V man, I like that. Yeah. How did the show change, uh, if at all, from uh, in the, in the previews? Not not much. I mean, the you know Des McEnough and and um, the creatives always had a very strong idea about what the show was going to be, even on the Hoyer, and it was a very you know strong statement what they wanted to put across, and it it's a fantastic show, and it really works. You know what what they've got together, and they've honed it over the time that that they've been doing you know the tour in, in Broadway in Chicago in Las Vegas and and here in the West End they really wanted to you know you know to put the cherry on the pie with this and we've made a few alterations I mean it's just to, you know to point things out more to the English audience about the time to make sure you know that the timeline is, is is very well documented and pointed out but I mean um as in terms of uh, any major script changes or or songs it, it's basically how it is not too much of a stressful period then well i think glenn carter who plays tommy devito had a bit of a stressful period because they were always messing because he opens the show in the first 20 minutes and they were always messing because they've got a lot of jokes in um in the new york show about you know new jersey and everything else and people people love to laugh at new jersey like uh, i suppose people from from london laugh like to laugh at people from essex or wherever it is but um there's a joke in family guy i don't know if you've seen this show where they're um driving into new jersey and there's a sign saying welcome to new jersey what like you're so special oh yeah i mean i love family guy i love the uh i love the amadeus one play some peter griffin i, I love that it's, uh, it's one of my favorite shows i think it's great i used to like the simpsons until until i saw family guy i thought family guy was just a ripoff of the simpsons but then i understood when when i saw uh, peter griffin stab yogi bear in the back and go there there there, there. I knew this was something special. Well, one of the best lines is when Stewie says um, to Peter, "You are the worst thing to have a musical theatre ever since Andrew Lloyd Webber." <laughs> I know. Well, I'm not going to comment on that. So, so no huge changes. I mean, we, we can't. Um... No, I think the show is so strong as a unit that, that there was never going to be any any um, huge changes. And uh, I mean, the great thing about you know Jill Jill Green, who did our casting, they got the casting absolutely perfectly you know right and it was it was just great i mean there's such a fantastic collection of people here who could really tackle anything that you threw at them anyway so it wouldn't really matter if there was but um you know it didn't have to be that way and it's terrible i suppose when you're in a show and there is so many changes and previews is very you know the un- the unrest is, is is not good i mean I, my heart goes out to the, the people that were in desperately seeking susan because they had a, you know had some friends in that and they had a terrible time with with so many dramatic changes um in the previews but you know i, I think that's the thing if you you got a strong idea you stick with it you believe in it and you know you'll reach your goal in the end you're not in the four seasons musical if you don't believe that and um thank you very very much brilliant thank you
And you'll hear more from Ryan in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you very much for listening to this week's episode of Musical Talk, and we'll see you next week. Bye. This has been a production of Musical Talk, copyright 2008. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at feedback at musicaltalk.co.uk. Thanks for listening. Keep talking, so I've got food right now. <laughs>